Well, hello everyone. This is Alfadi, and I wel welcome you to another uh, special episode of Let Us Reason, our Q and A sessions with Sam Shimon, and with us here, of course, our uh, dear brother uh, Hussein, or you want to call him Steve Mashney. So, uh, basically, you can say that I have the chief infidel, that Sam Shimon, and the chief apostate, uh, Steve Mashney. So. You're in good company, folks. Uh, today, we are going to continue, really, with what we started a couple of days ago, where Steve will bring in some questions that our Muslim friends tend to ask. And Sam Shimon uh, will, uh, as always, will take that question and begin to expand on it. So with that in mind, thank you so much for all of you who are joining us. Thank you to the moderators for uh, the amazing work you do. And uh, we pray that if any Muslim is with us here today, that they will really heed to the questions and also uh, listen to the answers. And if they have any questions, if any of you have any specific questions, keep it respectful, of course. Please go ahead and type it up and we will look at those uh, periodically. Uh, with that in mind, uh, Sam and uh, Steve, welcome brothers. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to do so. And Sam, would you like to uh, start us with a word of prayer, brother? <clears throat> yes, yes. <clears throat> I can hear my voice through there. Oh, no, no, <clears throat> I need my voice too. I just did a three hour session. Father, we praise you. We love you. We love your son, the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> we love your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name that your son will increase in us. And Al and Steve and myself and all who are listening, more of Jesus, less of us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to glorify Jesus in the way we live, in the way we worship, in the way we love, in the way we serve. <clears throat> save us from error, save us from stammering and confusion, and give us the health we need, the vigor from your Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus. Strengthen <clears throat> my voice, Steve's voice, Al, Al's voice, Father, and please fill our lungs and our chest and our heart and our throat with health from the Holy Spirit that our voice will always be strong and be used to glorify Jesus, magnify Jesus without fear and shame, even unto death, and bless the Muslims who are here because the spirit is bringing them open their hearts and minds to see the true jesus christ and see why muhammad is a false prophet and protect your church and arise in defense of your church that's persecuted embolden us to know death is not the end of us because christ is alive and we will live forever have your way in this session we love you bobby we love you son of god lord jesus we love you holy spirit take over the session in our lives for the glory of jesus in jesus name amen, <clears throat> amen. thanks brother so Anytime. steve um Give us a question that we can uh, lead off with. Well, um, you know, this is this is a, a particular subject, actually, that I've been encountering more and more these days, um, especially on the Internet. And it's about this rabbi named Tovia. Yeah, yeah Tovia. And I wonder, yeah. What's, what's exactly the story about him? And, you know, why are Muslims so eager to embrace a rabbi? Mm -hmm. so, um, you cut off. What was that? Just He's wondering why the Muslims oh, are. That's the only Muslims. question you got. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought there was like something else. Oh no. Uh, no. <clears throat> yeah. Well, <sighs> what's that saying? There's a saying that we use in a, in <clears throat> in English. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah. You know how? You know uh, <clears throat> they have a common cause. Tobias Singer hates the real Jesus, hates the real God revealed in Jesus. So do Muslims. Even though Tobias Singer would condemn Muhammad as a prophet because he rejects Muhammad as a prophet and he rejects what the Quran says about Jesus being the Messiah, he will not hesitate to join Muslims on their shows to bash Christians, bash the New Testament, blaspheme the real Jesus because their source is one. They have a common origin. Their father is the devil. I know it's not politically correct to say so, but anyone who's not born of the Spirit, who doesn't worship Jesus Christ as the Father's beloved Son, they belong to the devil until and unless the Holy Spirit sets them free. So because Satan and his demons are influencing them, though they don't have the same beliefs and their beliefs contradict each other, but because Satan's common enemy is the true Jesus, he will then move them to unite in spite of their differences because under... Uh, under any other circumstances, the Muslims would be murdering the Orthodox Jews and vice versa if the Orthodox Jews had <clears throat> enough power to do so. But Satan will move them to unite in their common cause of blaspheming Jesus. That's why Muslims love Tovia Singer, because he helps them destroy the New Testament 
and the New Testament claims for Jesus and why Tovia loves Muslims because he loves the Muslims enough to know that the Muslims can be used as a weapon to kill Christians because he can't do it. So he'll let someone else do his dirty work because their father is the same, which is why they all must be muzzled the same nonetheless by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Amen to that. So, uh, Steve, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, that guy mm -hmm. hates, uh, hates our Lord with passion, actually. With passion. With passion. Say, yeah. Steve, um, um, give us another question. Okay. This is, this is, a, this is the last question I wanted to ask you last time we were together and it, it, we kind of didn't have them enough time. And this is another thing. In fact, I even heard this when I went out to the, to the, uh, witnessing last week at the uh, supermarket out here. And that is that the whole, that the, the Trinity there, it w was not originally from uh, the church fathers, but it came about at the church of night at the council of Nicaea. And uh, you know, I, you always hear almost everything came from the, from the council of yeah. Nicaea. So, uh, you know, what's yeah. about that situation? Yeah, yeah so, typical so. argument, typical argument. And they also claim that the Bible was uh, collated at that time. They claim that the gospel yeah. for yeah. them or, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, no, I'm saying <clears throat> Nicaea gets blamed for everything. Mm -hmm. Now, the assertion now, what's it's interesting. You said <clears throat> these Muslims claim that at the Council of Nicaea, that's when the church formulated the doctrine of the Trinity. Because you have other Muslims, more sophisticated like Shibra Ali, who will tell you, no, that at the Council of Nicaea, what they decided was to affirm the absolute eternal deity of Jesus Christ and his essential equality with the Father. The subject of the Spirit awaited another council, the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. That's when the Holy Spirit was deified and placed on the same level of the Father and the Son. Because subsequent to Nicaea, you had certain groups that were questioning the divine person of the Holy Spirit. They were known as the Numatochians, Numatochians, the spirit destroyers. And you had some excellent church fathers, superb, highly intelligent, God-fearing, holy servants of the Lord, known as the Cappad Cappadocian fathers, Cappadocian, who had to refute these heretics and prove that the Holy Spirit is truly God. He's distinct from the Father and Son, but one with them in essence. So then they convened the council, Council of Constantinople, where there the focus was on the Holy Spirit. So in Nicaea, the focus was on Jesus. So let me just close the door, I'm sorry, because we're waiting for my cat. That's what happens when you have a cat in your life. Okay, now, <clears throat> the focus of Nicaea was on the claims of Arius, Yes. The claims of Arius. And again, we're trusting the Holy Spirit to guide us to speak truth without error for the glory of Christ. Arius was a priest from Alexandria, Egypt, who started writing hymns, espousing his heretical view of Jesus around 318 AD. <clears throat> what he believed was that Jesus was the first creation of God the Father, that Jesus is God, and that he existed before creation, meaning the creation of the heavens and the earth, but he did not exist eternally in that he had a beginning. And the cause of his beginning is the Father. So he was like an ancient Jehovah Witness. He was similar to Jehovah's Witnesses. Not the same, but like Jehovah's Witnesses, he believed that Jesus was the first creation of the Father. God brought him into being and through him brought everything else into being. And <clears throat> unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, he believed that Jesus also created the Holy Spirit. And unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, he believed that Jesus, when he became man, did not have a human spirit. Well, it may be like the Jehovah's Witnesses, because the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe your soul, your spirit is separate from you. Your soul and spirit is you. And when you die, your soul and spirit ceases to exist. It's not a distinct aspect of your personhood that's separate from your physical body. But with that said, so the debate was, is Jesus divine? in the absolute eternal sense to the same sense that the father is, or is he divine in a lesser sense? Because no one at Nicaea denied that Jesus was God. Nobody. So if a Muslim is trying to use Arius as a prototype of a Muslim follower of Jesus, well, that means Muhammad is a fraud because Arius believed Jesus is God and existed before creation and was the agent that created everything. 
So he wasn't a Muslim, nor was he a Trinitarian. And so because he started writing hymns celebrating that Jesus is the first creation of God, you know how it is. You're a musician, Steve. When you put something to song, you find it has a much more powerful influence and impact than if it's a book because very few people read books and very few people memorize books. But when you put it to song, multitudes hear it and memorize it. So his influence spread like cancer in that people heard his hymns, were then singing them, not realizing they were singing heresy and being indoctrinated by his heresy. So his bishop was Alexander of Alexandria, Egypt. And one, one champion who ended up becoming the bishop of Alexandria, Egypt was Athanasius. So they had a showdown because Constantine, and I'm trying to be as accurate as possible and succinct as possible, Around the year 312, 313 AD, Constantine claimed to have seen a vision where he saw the cross in the sky. And he was told, in this sign you shall conquer. By this sign you shall conquer. So Constantine placed the cross on his shields and defeated his enemies. So he attributed his victory to Jesus, the God of the Christians. And so then he adopted Christianity as the official religion of the empire. However, he realized the Christians were disunited because of these Christological viewpoints. So he decided to get the Christians together to settle the dispute. So Nicaea in Turkey, he convened the council. He gave them enough time to come there. And according to church historians who wrote after the fact about Nicaea, there are about 318 bishops there. 302 of them who had physical wounds because at that time, Christians were very serious about their faith, not like today. They would actually beat each other up. They came to blows. So you had Christians there with missing body parts because they were violent. They went to war and actually attacked each other physically over Jesus. In fact, there's another tradition, and there is no reason why this tradition isn't true, to belie this tradition, that Santa Claus was at the Council of Nicaea. Did you know that? Santa, I'm not lying. Santa Claus was at the Council of Nicaea. St. Nicholas. There was... A Christian named St. Nicholas from where, from where we get Santa Claus. So Santa Claus, this figure, Santa Claus comes from St. Nicholas. He was an actual Christian saint known for his charity. He was actually at the Council of Nicaea. And tradition says he got so angry at what he heard coming from Athanasius that some tradition says he slapped him. Others said he punched him. So St. Saint, Saint Nicholas, Santa Claus was being very naughty, not nice. Wow. But that just, tells you, that just tells you the passion of these Christians. They loved Jesus so much, they were willing to go to blows and be killed and beaten for his honor. Why do you have to destroy my image of Santa Claus, bro? <laughs> yeah. But you know what tradition also says, bro? Talk about it. It says, as he was in prison, he had a vision where Jesus and the Blessed Mother appeared to him. And he was released the next day. Okay, so what's the point? No one at Nicaea was debating the deity of Christ. There were no ones there who thought Jesus was merely human. The debate was, is Jesus as old as the Father or is he a creation? Athanasius soundly refuted Arius on the basis of Scripture. He used his reasoning from Scripture to silence his blasphemy. Now, what does that tell you? Contrary to the Muslims, that tells you that Arius and Athanasius were working from a common set of scriptures. In other words, they couldn't have this debate if they weren't both presupposing a collection of inspired books of scripture that they all agreed was the word of God. Because Athanasius and Arius were debating from scripture who Jesus was, which means that the knowledge of the Bible was already common knowledge and shared by heretic and orthodox alike. Otherwise, how are you going to engage me if we don't agree to the very books from which we get our faith from? See? So the debate wasn't a canon. The canon was already something assumed. Both Athanasius and Arius were quoting the same collection of books because they both agreed that these books were the inspired words of God, inspired scripture that we need to turn to in order to prove our beliefs. So Athanasius won out because his arguments were primarily scriptural, whereas Arius' view was primarily philosophical. What do I mean by that? Unfortunately, due to the influence of people like Origen, 
where they try to marry Greek philosophy with Christian theology, they ended up saying things that <clears throat> contradicted the testimony of Scripture. And you find this in the fathers. Because remember, they were Greek. Many of the fathers came out of Greek paganism and philosophy. So they're influenced by Stoicism or <clears throat> Aristotelian logic or Platonism. Arius was influenced by Origen, who was influenced by Plotinus. Now, I'm not trying to get technical. I'm not trying to sound intelligent. Why is that important? Because among the Greeks, they believe that the, the, the eternal God was the immovable mover, the unmovable mover. And he wouldn't defile himself by creating the material universe because for them, the material universe was evil. And so what did they believe, the Greeks? That the monad, they called them the monad. The monad, the immovable mover, would never create matter because it's vile and filthy. So what did the monad do? He created an intermediate being called the demiurge. And the demiurge did the dirty work for him. So notice, you had the monad, and then you had the demiurge. So guess what Arius did? He took those concepts and Christianized them, where he made the father the monad and made Jesus the demiurge, contrary to Scripture. That was the debate at Nicaea. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if my memory serves me right, Sam, he was also, I believe, the bishop of Alexandria? Uh, I know he was a priest. I don't believe he made it to be a bishop. But I know yeah. that when he started his own cult movement, he became a bishop of his own followers because the a bishop of Alexandria was Alexander and then Athanasius. But here's the problem. A lot of people don't tell you this part. Even though at Nicaea, Arius was soundly defeated from Scripture, Constantine ended up sympathizing with the Arians. People don't tell you this part of the history because they make it like Constantine forced the Trinity. How? When after Nicaea, he sympathized with the Arians and helped the Arians to persecute the Trinitarians <clears throat> to the extent that Athanasius had to flee from his church because soldiers were coming in to arrest him because now Constantine sided with the Arians against the Trinitarians. It wasn't until the year 380 when Theodosius, that emperor of Rome, decided to then reinforce the decision of Nicaea and then ousted the Arians. Athanasius had to flee from his bishop, bishop what they call it, bish, bishopric, it's technical term, bishopric, five times. As the soldiers were coming, he had to flee because Constantine empowered the Arians. So Arius would have been a bishop for his Arian followers, but the Trinitarians never recognized him as a bishop. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Uh, that was uh, very helpful. Uh, Steve, um, you have another yeah, question? You so we can hear you. By yeah. the way, you don't need to mute yourself anymore, Steve, because I'm not in your home. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, um, yeah, I just want to say one thing about what you were just saying. Is that a lot of these councils, they, you know, I heard somebody saying this the other day, that the councils didn't actually just come about for the sake of coming up with beliefs, but they yeah. were usually responses to heresies that were out yeah. there, and they're trying to combat heresies. And uh, but yes. uh, but uh, another thing I want to say is it's kind of funny that the fun, the most famous saints in America are St. Nick and St. Patrick, and both of them are very close to the doctrine of the Trinity. They have something to do with the Trinity, yeah. so, but anyway. 100%. 100%. <laughs> um, was was St. Um, Patrick drinking beer at that time? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> three, three, so, uh, clover, three clover. By the way, <laughs> just for, the, for you guys, uh, and you can post it for your mods, I just gave you a link on my post. It's, uh, it's Ignatius of Antioch. Let me tell you why that's important, and you can probably make it available because I can't post links because you didn't make me a mod. But for those of you in the private chat, you'll see it, and Al will see it, and you can then pass it on. I, I quoted from the seven letters of Ignatius of Antioch. Now, let me tell you why it's important in answering your objection to the Muslims. Ignatius was the bishop of Antioch, Syria. He was a disciple eyewitness of the apostles like John. He wrote seven letters that have been preserved and translated in English. And I quote from his seven letters, he wrote to some of the churches that Paul wrote to, like Philippians and Rome, Romans. In those letters, written around 107, 112 AD, 107, 112 AD, he exhorts the churches that he's writing to, to follow the commands of the Lord. But in those letters, 
he has the highest view of Jesus imaginable. He affirms that Jesus is our God in the flesh. Jesus, our God, who shed his blood. Jesus, our God, who is a seed of David, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus, our God, who is timeless, uncreated, eternal, impassable, who became part of creation to be passable. This is all from a man who was a disciple of the apostles, who knew the apostles, who would have been appointed by them to be the bishop of Antioch, Syria, who on his way to being fed by lions willfully, because in his letter to the Romans, which you can read, he's pleading with the Romans, do not stop me from being killed. I want to go to the arena and be fed by the lions because I want to die as a sacrifice for my God and Savior Jesus. Let me die this death in honor of my Lord. This is the kind of Christians we're talking about, not like us sissies today. And this man who knew the apostles would have been appointed by them, who dies as a holy martyr, is saying Jesus is the uncreated, eternal God, the Son of the Father, and he affirms the Trinity. In the year 107, 112 AD, long before Nicaea. Exactly. I mean, these things are very important because uh, especially for our brothers and sisters who really get stumped by these kind of questions and think like the Trinity wasn't developed as a doctrine until later. No, no, no. It was just basically affirmed. There's a difference between developed and affirmed. Nobody developed the doctrine. It's there already. It's just affirmed by showing you the passages exactly. that you can go to. Yeah. Yeah. Councils do not create new doctrines. Councils come to debate doctrines already affirmed to see which of the doctrines are true and which are heresies, right? So that means the belief in Jesus as equal to the Father and Arius' belief would have been beliefs that were already in circulation before the council. Otherwise, there would be no reason to convene a council to settle this dispute, right? You mean that one day that, hey, uh, guys, I'm just going to convene a council and come up with some heresy just for the heck of it because I need a council. That's not how it works. Yeah. But anyway, brother, I know you posted the link once. Can you post it again for the benefit I of me? But uh, we have a gentleman who is an ex-Jew, uh, Adonis. Adonis, I don't know if you're a believer in Christ or not, but he's asking. No, I, had to block him. Yeah, I had to block him from my channel because I don't know if it's sincere because some of the questions he asks are just like out there. But what did he say? Okay, so maybe he asked this question before. Uh, the question is, why was there ever doubt that Christ is not Lord? Uh, see, he's not paying attention. See, this is why he was getting blocked, because he hears what he wants. Who said any of the Christians denied, it, denied Jesus Lord? Arius believed Jesus is God, who was created by God, but still existed before creation, and is the God who created everything. That means he would have believed that Jesus is divine and Lord in some sense. So he's not paying attention. This is oh, why we have to lock him on my channel. Well, let it slide for the first time. Okay, yeah. Steve, uh, next question, please. And please ask a good one this time, okay? Please. I mean, not, not... All right. Uh, and again, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to save me from error. May the Lord forgive me if I made any mistakes. I hope I, I'm not. But go ahead, brother. All right. Um, you know, I'm kind of torn. I got three questions I'd really love to get talk about. Ask them. Go Do ahead, you know? ask. Do you mind? I would really like to get a little bit into eschatology because this comes okay. up every now and then too about the Dijab, the Mehdi, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want me to answer that? We'll ask your question so you know what you're asking. So a lot of people don't know. Uh, you, uh, I'm sorry. Ask the question because people don't know what you. I know what you're talking about, but they don't. The Dijal. Okay, yeah. what does that mean? So ask yeah, so they know you know, I've right. heard some people try to say that the Dijab in Islam is. Um, that it's, uh, if I listen to John MacArthur talk about this, and he said that it's flipped around. It says that their Dajjal is actually Jesus because he comes with a, he's riding a donkey and he's, uh, and yeah. he's, you know, humble and meek. Okay. And, and that the Jesus is the false, or Isa is the false prophet, and that the yeah. Mehdi is the Antichrist. Have you ever heard yeah. of that? Or, yeah, I've heard this. A lot of people have made it popular, and I'm just going to share with you what I see in Scripture. Because remember, I'm not infallible. Al definitely is not infallible, and neither are you, Steve. I'm closer to infallibility than either one of you. But besides that, so uh, Sam, when, yes. if, before you talk about it from the Scripture, may I just give the Islamic side of things real quickly? Sure. Okay. So, so, so people basically, uh, those of you who are joining us right now, uh, Steve is talking about characters that are affiliated with Islamic eschatology in times. For instance, there are Sunni views, by the way, and there is Shia view. 
That's right. In general, there is the belief in something called the Dejal, which is the Antichrist, has one eye, has the word infidel written on his forehead, comes basically to deceive people and conquer and so on and so forth. Then there is Jesus who is coming back, but this is a Muslim Jesus who comes back to destroy the cross, kill the pigs, fight the Jews and the Christians until they either convert or he's going to fight them and kill them. And then he basically will rule. Now, the Shia will say he and someone called the 12th Imam or the Mahdi, the guided one, will be the rulers. The Sunnis don't care much about the Mahdi. They just care about the fact that Jesus will come back. And then, in fact, they believe he's going to marry. He's going to live for 40 years. He's going to die. And then the end will happen. So these are the characters that we're talking about right now. Go ahead, bro. Yeah. yeah. As he summed up, like he said, a lot of there are some Sunni Muslims, uh, ulama, that didn't believe in a Mahdi character, even though there are traditions that you'll find where it says that the Mahdi will be from the family line of Muhammad, his name will be Muhammad, and it will rule for seven years. That's in the Sunni tradition. But there are some Sunni scholars that say those are weak traditions. Others say no. Weak doesn't mean they're false. Anyway, so as you heard what the brother said, Sunni tradition, this Mahdi, that's the name Mahdi, according Sunnis, will be from the family line of Muhammad. He'll rule for seven years, and the name will be Muhammad. He'll unify Muslims. Then Al-Masih Al-Dajjal will appear. He'll appear right alongside the Mahdi. The Al-Masih Al-Dajjal means the false messiah. And then Jesus will descend upon two angels, and he will... Lead the Mahdi and the Muslim armies, and just by his appearance, he will destroy the Mahdi. Mahdi will dissolve from the appearance of Jesus. This is in the Sunni tradition. Now, in the Shia tradition, they believe Mahdi is the 12th Imam, the Rafida, which is the derogatory term, from what I've been told. The 12th Imam disappeared. He, Allah has hidden him with the true Quran, and he'll reappear because they believe in the the Imamate, the 12 infallible Imams, right? Well, this 12th one is going to reappear with the perfect Quran, and he is the Mahdi. Anyway, what Steve is telling me is, is this Mahdi character, is he the Antichrist that the Bible warns us about? That's really the question. Because there are Christians who believe that this Mahdi figure is the one the Bible says will be the Antichrist. Now, I have problems with that view, and I'm not the only one. And I know there are Christians who actually believe this. One of the most famous Defenders of this view is Joel Richardson. He's a brother in the Lord who writes for Answering Islam. He wrote a book on this. In fact, I think he wrote at least two books. Islamic Antichrist. Actually. Yeah. He's convinced the Mahdi is the Antichrist. Now, Walid Shabbat used to believe that, but he's changed his position. A reason why I have problems with this position. Here's the problem. If we go with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Daniel 11, and Revelation 13. If you take those three chapters, which are commonly used to point to the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Revelation 13, Daniel 11 as well, because they say that Antiochus is a precursor, a picture of the Antichrist. Because there are things said about Antiochus and Daniel 11 that don't fully <clears throat> apply to him because he's a picture of someone else to come. Okay. We know according to Scripture, the man of iniquity, the man of lawlessness, called the beast in Revelation 13, will claim to be God, will de demand to be worshipped as God, will oppose the God of heaven and mislead people away from worshipping Jesus to worshipping himself. Okay, so that's a characteristic of the Antichrist from the New Testament. The, the Antichrist in the New Testament will demand to be worshipped as God. He will set himself in the temple of God, sitting on the seat of God, claiming to be God, and he will oppose the God of heaven and mislead people away from worshiping God into worshiping himself. This cannot be the Mahdi. Why? Because in Islam, according to the Sunni tradition, if the Mahdi claims to be God, he's disqualified. No Muslim can follow the Mahdi if he says he's God. That's anathema. That's because true. that means he's not a true Muslim. Because that means he denied the Shahada. That means he, com he committed kufr. So that's the first problem with the Mahdi being the Antichrist that we're waiting for. Second problem, Muhammad in the narration speaking about the Messiah, the false Messiah says the false Messiah will do miracles, deceptive miracles, and claim to be God and demand to be worshipped. So know him because he's going to do miracles to deceive you and demand you worship him and he'll claim to be your God. 
Well, you know he's not your God because Allah is your God and he has one eye and he has on his forehead the words kafir, but your Lord, Allah is not one eye. Okay, well, how are the Muslims going to be duped into following the Antichrist when Muhammad told them, this is how you're going to know the Antichrist. He's going to claim to be God, reject him. So how in the world can you reconcile what Muslims believe about the Mahdi with our Antichrist? The Mahdi of Islam cannot claim to be God, but our Antichrist will claim to be God and demand people to worship him instead of Jesus. So how can they be the same figure? Wow, that's good. Exactly. That's exactly. my problem with this concept. Yeah, and uh, people can read about it. By the way, there's a lot of wonderful articles written on this just on answering Islam alone. Uh, brother, did you write about it uh, yourself uh, in your well, Eschatology, because it's so dangerous to get it wrong, and we have a track record among evangelicals especially. Every evangelical is written about end times has been proven wrong. From Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, to Harold Camping, everyone that has spoken about end times has embarrassed themselves because everything they've said has been proven to be false. We have to be careful because when you say something that turns out to be false, you're not discrediting yourself. You're giving a weapon in the hands of unbelievers to discredit the Bible and Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And then Yasin Ibrahim, I find it funny, really, that a liar like you would show up over here and mock us and make fun of us. So for that alone, I'm going to block you right now. So are you ready? I have a magic finger, by the way. Here is what it does. It does one click and the second click, you're out. Thank you. Okay. Next, brother. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that like when we were at Balboa Park that I really... I started talking with one guy about it and I got as far as I could with him about it. And that is that in Islam, there are eternal things besides Allah. Yeah. And, uh, specifically the word of Allah, you know, the Quran being eternal. Yes. How can you use that? How can you use that in telling them about the fact that, you know, if he's not created by Allah, how did it exist if it wasn't created by Allah? You know, yeah. and this is what the guy said. The guy that I was talking to, he's one of the guys that grew, was around me at Balboa Park. And this guy says, oh, it's the word of Allah. It's not created, you know. And uh, and so, you know, how could you use that to, um, you know, to, to show them that there's God, the word, and the spirit, you know? Well, I mean, he, he admitted to you right there that the Quran is Allah's word, therefore it's uncreated, right? Yeah. Yeah, because he's a Sunni. Uh, Sunni Muslims believe the Quran because it's one of the attributes of Allah. Now, I'm not trying to impress you guys with knowledge, but it does help to get Muslim attention if the brothers who are listening, brothers and sisters, understand some of the technical language of Islamic theology because then they're going to say, oh, these, these guys are really studying our, our religion. And then they're going to ask you, well, and you're still not a Muslim? And your response is, it's because I study religion, I can't be a Muslim. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, in Islamic theology, Sunni Islam, they believe that the attributes of Allah are uncreated. And the word, there's a technical term, sifat, sifat, which is a plural of sifa. And they believe the names of Allah are uncreated. And so Allah possesses certain characteristics and names that are uncreated because they are essential, they are necessary, Mm -hmm. to his essence. What do I mean by essence? Essence refers to that which is essential for a thing to be what it is. See, this is the problem when we use terms. You got to explain it. Essence means that which is necessary for a person to have or be in order to be what he is. So I'm a human being. Well, how do I know a human? I'm human because I have all those necessary characteristics that make a human being a human being. Well, Allah has divine essence. Part of his essence encompasses a host of attributes that he must possess to be truly God. One of those attributes that Allah must have to be truly God is now, speech. Before you go on, can I just ask you one thing? You just said one thing, and I just want to—I just want to clarify it for me. You said he has his sifat and he has his ninety-nine names. Yes, or he has names. Are they, are they all sifat? His names and his attributes, or his sifat? Yeah. Yeah, well, a name is a characteristic meaning. A name tells you something about Allah. Like when you say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, those are names, right? Mm -hmm. 
but they're also characteristics. They're telling you something about his character, that he is the merciful and he's the beneficent, right? The compassionate. So basically, all the names of Allah are characteristics. Like when you say Al-Aziz, what does that mean? The strong one, right? Dear one. Yeah, dear one. Yeah, yeah Aziz. Yeah, cause, yeah, is, is also, in some translations means honor or strength. But yes, you get the point. Al-Mutakabbir, the proud one, meaning that one of his characteristics is pride. So the names are characteristics. The names tell us something about Allah. Now, one of the names of Allah is Allah. What does that mean? See, that's the thing. And uh, I'll expand on it a little later. I don't want to confuse the people. So they say one of the essential characteristics of Allah, something Allah has to have in order to be truly self-sufficient, independent, because one of his names is Al-Ghani, right? The all-rich, meaning nothing. Okay. Kalam, speech, word. Allah cannot be truly God, free of all creation, if he doesn't eternally exist with his characteristic of speech. The word is kalam in Arabic. Kalam, speech or word. Now, because Allah's kalam, speech, is uncreated, he's always existed with speech. He could not exist without speech. And the Quran is said to be kalam Allah, speech of Allah. The Muslim scholars of the Sunni tradition concluded that means the Quran must be uncreated. Because notice the logic. Allah's speech is uncreated. The Quran is Allah's speech. Therefore, the Quran must be uncreated. Because if it's created, then you're saying Allah's speech, or at least a part of it was created, and that would be kufr, that would be blasphemy. So that's why the Sunnis will tell you, yeah, the Quran is uncreated, but it's not separate from Allah. It's one of his characteristics. Just like your word, it's not separate from you. It's a part of you. So I wouldn't say you and your word are two different persons. You are your word, your word is you. Now, that's an analogy that breaks down because they'll tell you that there's nothing com comparable to Allah. Allah is unlike anything. Okay, that's fine. But that's where you catch them. Say, okay, so you just admit the Quran is inseparable from Allah, right? Yeah, you can't separate the Quran from Allah, correct? Yes. Well, you just admitted that a part of Allah became physical and part of creation because the Quran also became a book, kitab. It's a kitab, a book. Well, the book is material. It's tangible, it's physical, it's part of time, space, and place. So the Quran is not the Quran unless it's a book. Well, if you can't separate the Quran from Allah, that means a part of Allah became a book and part of creation. You're stuck. Now, what are they going to tell you saying, no, but the Quran is not Allah? Okay, so now let's go back to that. So now the Quran is not Allah. Now you have two uncreated things. The Quran, which is not Allah, is uncreated. Allah is not created. Now you have two uncreated things. But now you're going to tell me, no, but it's not separate from Allah. Well, if it's not separate from Allah, that means now you're back to square one. A part of Allah became physical, became a book, and bound to time. That means anytime I rip the Mus'haf, the Arabic, I'm ripping a part of Allah. And anytime you produce multiple Mus'ahif, codices and books that are Arabic, that's Allah being multiplied in physical, tangible form. So Uthman burned a part of Allah when he burned all the Mus'ahif, the codices of the Quran, which are Arabic, because the Quran is inseparable from Allah, and the Quran is not the Quran. Let's it's a book. That means when the Quran became a book, a part of Allah became a book. So that means when I burn the Quran, I'm burning a part of Allah. When I bury the Quran, I'm burying a part of Allah. You can't escape the logic. Wow. Wonderful. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. Because you look stunned. I don't know if you're stunned and because it. Okay. Well, he'll be stunned because he's tired and he hasn't slept. Okay, but now if they come back to you, what I want you to remember, Steve, if they come back to you and say, well, no, no, the Quran is not Allah. Now you're back to my other problem. So the Quran is not Allah, it's separate from Allah. That's two uncreated things. So you don't believe there's only one uncreated thing. No, it's in separate. Now, we're, see, no matter how you slice and dice it, you're going to create one conundrum. If it's inseparable from Allah, that means a part of Allah became a material book and it became part of creation, and it's bound to creation. If the Quran is separable from Allah, now you have two eternal uncreated realities that are not the same. Amen. So you're stuck, buddy. Amen. Uh, do you have anything else related to this, Steve? Because I want to ask uh, another question. Okay, I, I have a I have a question on another on another subject, but go ahead. Okay, so let me make this. This is a quick comment, actually, and and you guys feel free, especially you, Sam, if you want to comment on it. So, so we have someone by the name X Dawa. You know anything about him? 
No. He, he says ex dao, so obviously he's not a Muslim. He keeps quoting 1 Corinthians 7.36, which I actually wrote about, to yeah, prove yeah. That the Bible teaches that a woman must have reached past the age of maidenhood. She must be post-pubescent physically and psychologically in order to be considered marriageable, marriage material. And I don't know how he then somehow thinks this justifies Muhammad marrying exactly. a nine-year-old. She was nine. He was 54. She wasn't past the age of blossoming. The Chadis say she was prepubescent. She was a premature minor, which is why she was still playing with dolls and on swings. So either this guy is ignorant or he's a deceiver. I don't know which it is. I mean, uh, the, the, the Greek word is hyper achmas. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, beyond. And yeah, and exactly. The idea. Yeah, beyond. he doesn't know any, he obviously doesn't know anything about the culture. In our culture, you know, sadly, of course, for women. There is a certain age. If you hit that age, somehow you become anis, we call it. You know, it's like you're nobody gonna marry you. And that's what Paul is talking about. Is like if you're really, really hitting that age, I mean, that's basically what he means past yeah. the flower of her age. Yes, meaning and, and also flower, he's assuming that she's already reached the age where she can be married and gone beyond it. So here it assumes if you haven't reached the flower of maidenhood, you're not marriageable material. So anyway, I don't know how this justifies Muhammad wearing a nine-year-old. I've actually used that verse to expose Muhammad as a pedophile. So I don't get it. Amen. I really don't. Uh, maybe he's, right. he's agreeing with me, but the way he stated his comment, it seems like he's disagreeing. Okay, uh, Steve. Okay, my my next question is it, it's a little bit related to the last one, and that is in the Quran, the Holy Spirit. Yes. You know how can you show? It seems like. There's many places where it seems like it's the Holy Spirit. Of what do you God. Say, it seems like, what do you, what do you mean, Sam? I mean, the Holy Spirit is you know, he's saying that the Holy Spirit is God, you know. So he says, I sent my spirit, you know, and, and it seems like it's affirming the deity of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the, it, will. It, do, it does. But uh, just one thing, um, the, the phrase Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, those two words, appears in chapter 2, verse 87. So I'm giving you guys the references. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 87. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verses 253. Surah Al-Maida, uh, Al chapter 5, verse 110. And then a fourth time, uh, chapter 16 of the Quran, verse 102. Those, so the words Holy Spirit appear in those four places. Other places, it speaks of the Ruh, the Spirit, or Ruh, you know, the faithful Spirit, Ruh Al-Alamin, Ruh Al-Alamin, right? So, is this the same spirit? Yes, you can show it's the same spirit. Now, this spirit, is it Jibreel, Gabriel, like Muslims say? No. Is the spirit simply God's power or presence, active force, like Joe's witnesses say? No. According to the Quran, and we've done so many shows on this, but I can we can look at a few references. The spirit is breathed out of Allah. Allah breathes out the spirit. It comes out of him. Let, let's just look at one, for example. Uh, go to chapter 38, verses 71, 72. Someone read that for me. I don't have the Quran. So 38, 71, 72. Okay, I'll go there. Um, 38. Yeah, verses 71 and 72. Okay, so we are at 38. We'll go to 71. Okay, 71 reads, Your Lord said to the angels i am creating a human being from clay um when i have formed him and breathe into him of my spirit fall prostrate before him so you catch it allah breathes out the spirit from himself so the first problem facing muslims if the spirit comes out of allah breathe out of allah that means it's not part of creation it's a part of him so my question to the muslims who are listening is there anything that comes out of Allah that's a part of Allah that's created? That would be blasphemy, would it not? Wouldn't that be blasphemy? If you're a Muslim, and I'm talking to you guys as well. If it's breathed out of Allah, that means it came out of him. What part of Allah can be said to be makhluk, creation? Nothing. So number one, the spirit doesn't come from creation. It comes out of him. So its origin is in him. So it's not created. So that's the first, first point. The second point. You got to get the Muslims to answer the question, why did Allah then send forth, breathe out the spirit 
into Adam. Why did he do that? Now, the sharp Muslim who's paying attention will tell you in order to animate him, to make him alive. Oh, so you're admitting the spirit is the one that Allah sends to make something alive. So that the spirit is creator, life giver. And this is also the case with, with Jesus. Because if you go to Surah Al-Tahrim, chapter 66, verse 12, it says, Maryam bit Imran, ahsanat farja. We've already talked about that. And then it says, Mary, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her private part, G rate it, we'll keep it. And we blew into her of our spirit. Okay, that's 6612. Allah blew his spirit, breathed or blew his spirit into Mary's private part. And it doesn't say here, it says we blew, blew into it there. There it says, Fihi, blew into it, her private part. But then there's the parallel in 2191, Surah Anbiya, 2191, same, same thing basically about Mary. It says, and the daughter of Imran, who guarded her private part. And there it says, we blew into her. Fiha. The preposition is different. Fiha in 2191. Fihi in 6612. Okay, so Allah blew his spirit into Mary, into her private part. So then he asked the Muslims again, why did he do that? They'll tell you because the spirit caused Mary to conceive and create the physical body, human nature of Jesus to get pregnant. So again, they're affirming the spirit gives life and creates. He gave life to Adam, made him alive, and he caused Mary to conceive a human life, the human nature, physical body of Jesus. So he's, he's creator and life giver, and he comes out of Allah. He doesn't come from creation. He comes out of Allah. So he's out of Allah, from Allah, who creates and gives life. Then in chapter 19 of the Quran, chapter 19, Surah Al-Maryam, 16 to 21, it says, and recount in the book the story of Mary, who... Shaded herself, veiled her, herself from her people in a place in the east. We sent to her, and I'm just paraphrasing here. We sent to her our spirit. It doesn't say our angel. Our spirit, Ruach, who appeared as a perfect man. So the spirit was sent and he appeared as a man, a perfect looking man, a flawless looking man. Now Mary didn't know that was a spirit. And then Mary said, I seek refuge with the all-merciful, the beneficent, if you are God-fearing. Now here's the key, verse 19, chapter 19, verse 19. There it says, and he said, the Spirit said, I am only a messenger from your Lord. So notice, he's not Allah. He's subject to Allah. Mm -hmm. He is sent from Allah as a Rasul. He's a Rasul Allah, an apostle of Allah. He speaks, so he's a person. He's a living, conscious person because he speaks. And has conversations, and Mary's speaking to him, and it can appear as a man, so convincingly that she didn't even know it's a spirit. She thought it's an actual man trying to do something. But here's the key, what he says. I'm only a messenger from your Lord to bestow on you, to give you a faultless son. So notice what he says. I was sent to give you a son that's pure. So wait, he didn't say, I was sent to announce you that Allah is going to give you a son. No. Allah sent me to give you a son, to get you pregnant exactly. with a son. Exactly. <laughs> so that mean, what does that mean? The spirit is a person. He speaks and can be spoken to. He can appear as a man. He's not part of creation. He comes out of Allah, originates out of Allah. So he's a part of Allah, meaning he's not part of creation, but part of Allah who's uncreated. So the Muslims tell me. He then creates and gives life. Showing that the spirit is creator, life giver, eternal. But at the same time, he's distinct from Allah, subject to Allah because he's a messenger of Allah. So that's two. Two who create, two who give life. One comes out of the other. So he's a part of that other, inseparable from him. And then subject to him who can appear as his messenger to others and speak on his behalf as his messenger. Who can appear as a man. Who is a person that can speak and be spoken to. And yet they tell me their God will not enter the world as a man. But God's spirit who comes out of him enters the world as a man. Oh, wait, Sam. What do you mean two? The English translation said we in Arabic nahnu. So there's still a third one. Where is he? Exactly. There's another one. And that really gets problematic if we go to the tafsir. I can then show you how the tafsir really destroyed Tawheed. Because when you go to the tafsir like Ibn Kathir, they'll say that when you read we breathe or blew into her out of our spirit. Now notice who's speaking. It's supposed to be Allah. We blew into her of our spirit. 
If you read the commentators, they'll say, Jibril, Gabriel, blew into Mary. That's what they say. And they go, he blew into the opening of her uh, kamis, and then that breath penetrated her organ, and then she got pregnant with Jesus. Okay, now, you see why that's a problem. Understand why that's a problem. If the verses say, Allah is the one who blew, we blew into our spirit. But then the commentators say, Gabriel blew. That means Gabriel is one of the we. He is a part of Allah who did the blowing. Because the verses say, Allah blew, but the commentators say, Gabriel blew. We blew into our, of our spirit. And they say, Gabriel blew the spirit into Mary. So now, we here means Allah and Gabriel together perform the act of blowing the spirit into Mary. Which means well, that now Gabriel's blowing the human spirit of Jesus into Mary. Well, I mean, Sam, I mean, it must have been a big blow. Uh, Allah needed somebody to help him, man. Pun intended. But, that, you know, that, in other words, if it's sunk in, if everyone got it, that means the we is Allah and Gabriel speaking together. So that means the we is not just Allah speaking in the plural majesty. It's Allah and Gabriel speaking together as partners. Wow. Well, that would make Gabriel Allah's divine partner because the plural pronouns are used in context where the people speaking are doing things that only God can do. So if that's including Gabriel as one of the speakers who's speaking with Allah as the we, then you made Allah and Gabriel both divine with the spirit. Amen. And by the way, folks, we did a number of videos, me and Sam, on the Tawheed Dilemma, on the Spirit of Allah. We did a podcast also about the topic related to that. So you can always go and access those. By the way, that podcast is also called Let Us Reason. And by the well, way, yeah, brother, that's great. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I mean, can I, before he goes to another question, I want to give you two examples of the we. Being can, I, can I say something before you go? There? Sure. Just because you gave me tomorrow's video that I'm going to do tomorrow. And uh, is that now... Allah no, 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 that's copyrighted, man. I mean, you cannot take it from here and do it tomorrow. <laughs> oh, ha, oh, baloney. I'm Palestinian. We're victims. We're being, well, they took our homes and our lands and our. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I blame Israel for everything. Go ahead. It. <laughs> it's the Jews you're working for. No, I'm just kidding. Is that Allah creates, Jesus created, it blew into the bird, and yeah, here the Holy Spirit creates. All three of them yep. create. That's my yep. video tomorrow. So, anyway, thanks. Exactly. Yeah, now, but let me give you where the we is a nightmare for the Muslims, where the we is clearly angels, or so the Muslims tell us. But when you read the passage, it's actually Allah and a group that's united to him. What do I mean? Do me a favor, brother. Ignore the parenthetical comments or the comments in brackets by English translations that deceive you. Go to chapter 19 of the Quran, read 63 first. Chapter 19. I was born in 1963, you guys, by the way. Then good year. In fact, I was told that the sun didn't shine for the entire day that year. Wow. Um, it, it, was, it was a bad day for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, yeah, 1963. Fascinated, but okay. <laughs> okay. Verse 63 reads, Such is paradise which we will give as inheritance to those of our servants who are devout. Okay, now, notice who's speaking, guys. Such is paradise. And then what does it say? I want them to see the, pro the pronouns. Okay, so such is paradise, which we, we will give as inheritance to those of our servants who are devout. So notice, this is Allah speaking in the plural. You can't get around it. We will give an inheritance to our servants. But now in 64, the same group is speaking. What does it say in 64? All right. So verse 64 says, We don't descend except by the command of your Lord. Uh -oh. His is what is before us and what is behind us. And what is between them, your Lord is never forgetful. Forget it, man. That's confusing. I get a headache, man. I need to drink tea right now. I'm confused. Mm -hmm. I got okay, I'm confused. Guys, if you paid attention, I'm confused. In 63, the we said, we give our servants an inheritance. That's clearly only God because you are servants of God. And he gives inheritance. But then the we says in 64, we do not come down, come down except by command of your Lord. And he's ever before us and around us. Wait, so the we 
says, we only come down by command of your Lord, and yet we are the ones who give inheritance to our servants. So who's the we and who's their Lord? Yeah, exactly. Why don't you keep talking? Because there is uh, uh, somebody that I'm going to go on block right now. He is on Facebook. He thinks I can't find him. So, okay, keep going, bro. Keep, yeah, keep yeah. Going. And then, uh, when we get a chance, well, why don't you look at the second example? Chapter 17, verse 1. Okay, we'll go to 17, 1. Yes. I remember this one. I still got a headache from it last time. So, so yeah, this is the exactly. extension. All right. So, glory to him so, who I journeyed. Know his servant by night from the sacred mosque to the farthest mosque whose precincts we have blessed in order to show him of our wonders. He is the listener, the beholder. I have no idea who is the he here. And okay. Who's the other and him. Exactly. But I want them to pay attention. Last part of the verse, it says that we might show him some of our wonders, right? Exactly. We, guys, if you're not paying attention, you're not going to catch it. Those are, uh, Al and Steve, they can also see the Arabic, they'll catch it. We will show him some of our wonders. So the we is Allah again. Allah is going to show this one his wonders, his signs. But then it says of the him, he is the seeing, the hearing. He whose wonders we will show, he is the seeing, the hearing. But that's Allah, right? Allah is the one who sees and hears. <laughs> but hold on. The we says, we will show him our wonders. But the him is the seeing and the hearing. He is the seeing and the hearing. So why is Allah being shown wonders by this group when Allah is almighty? But if you say it's Muhammad, we showed him, Muhammad, our wonders. He, Muhammad, is the seeing and hearing. You just made Muhammad omniscient, omnipotent. Exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, these are excellent examples, Sam, because it shows that this idea of Tawheed is nothing but there is a Greek word that I studied at a seminary called baloney. Yeah. How, how do you transliterate it? But you guys caught it, right? You caught it that the him is the same one who said to be, he is the seer, the hearer, the all seeing, the all, all hearing, right? But that's the same him that the we showed their signs to. Him we showed him our signs, and he is the seeing and the hearing. That's Allah, so why does Allah need you to show him signs? He's the one who shows signs. But if that's Muhammad, then Muhammad is the seeing and the hearing, and you made Muhammad divine, so you got a problem. But anyway, whatever question you have. Well, I got two. Right, so, Sam, we have about 30 minutes. Can you stay? No, I, I got that. No, no, I got that. Right. Okay, go ahead, I Steve. I got two easy questions. The rest two are, okay, the one of them, is the uh okay about the one about today you know today you became my son yeah today i've begotten you yeah that's an uh, that's psalm 2 7 quoted in acts 13 33 quoted in hebrews 1 5 quoted in hebrews 5 5 so let me repeat you're giving me psalm 2 7 which is quoted by paul in acts 13 33 in reference to jesus's resurrection ascension and it's quoted by Hebrews in reference to Jesus' resurrection ascension. Hebrews 1.5 and Hebrews 5.5. 5. So let's look at it. You're asking me, what does that mean? Yeah, well, what is the, you know, today I've begotten you, you know. Oh, yeah. It, it sounds like he wasn't the son and he was begotten then at that point, you know. Well, the question is, what kind of sonship does the author have in mind? I did an entire session not too long ago for William, which is on my YouTube channel. And I've done it in previous sessions on my own channel. Uh, uh, where there are different senses in which you are a son of God and God is your father. But to understand this particular sense, you have to go see where it's quoted from. It's quoted from Psalm 2, verse 7. So let's go to Psalm 2 to see what the context is all about. Psalm 2, we're going to read 6 and 7. All right. I have it already ready. So I'm going to read verse 6. As for me. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So if you read contextually, the day that God is uttering this decree is the day where the king begins to reign on God's throne on earth in Zion. 
Reread it again so Steve can see it. Psalm 2, verses 6 to 7. Verse 6, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will let uh, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. It's talking about the coronation of the king of Israel, that on the day he sits on the throne installed as king over Israel on God's earthly throne, that's the day God begets him as a son. Today I've begotten you to be my son, to rule on my behalf on earth on the throne. So this type of sonship refers to what I would call royal sonship, that those appointed by God to reign on his earthly throne, which was in Jerusalem, on his behalf, the day in which they began reigning, God then adopted them into his family as his sons, he being their father who would fight for them and protect them and defend them against their enemies, provided they maintain covenant faithfulness, right? You're getting that so far, right? That's the context. This is why when Solomon, who's the heir to David, when he's chosen to sit on the throne on behalf of David, God says, he too will be my son. I'll be his father. Go to First Chronicles 22, wow. verses 7 to 10. This guy, Abdul Rafa, he's calling us Muhammad's pet names. He goes, Muhammad the Khanzir with Allah the Khanzir. Anyway, uh, if you go to First Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. Then read it for us. All right, verse 7 to 10. Verse 7, David said to Solomon, my son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. Hmm. Okay, now keep reading all the way to 10. Verse 10, he shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. Did you catch it? He shall be my son, I'll be his father. When? When he sits on the throne on your behalf, David, and I will establish his kingdom. So these passages, which are quoted in reference to Jesus, are referring to Davidic royal sonship. What do I mean, Davidic? If you read, and if we had more time, I could elaborate on this. God swore an everlasting, irrevocable covenant with David, which you'll find in Psalm 89. If you just read the entire Psalm 89, it's all about this irre irrevocable, irrevocable covenant. Where God swore to David. He goes, the words that came out of my mouth, I will not alter. The throne is yours forever, and you will not fail to have a man sitting on the throne on your behalf. But there's a condition. He says, those who come after you, they must maintain covenant faithfulness, because if not, I will punish them, dispossess them, and then raise up another physical descendant of yours to sit on the throne. But you will never fail to have a physical son sitting on the throne, my earthly throne over Jerusalem, from your house, because that's my love for you and my promise for you, and I'll never revoke it. So how does God then fulfill that promise? Well, in order to be that kind of son, that type of royal son of God, you must be a physical son of David, because this promise was given to who? David and his household. So number one, you cannot inherit the throne if you're not a physical son of David. That's number one. Number two, David had many sons. So not every son was qualified. A specific son would be chosen. So you had to be a physical son of David and the one chosen to sit on David's throne. Now, in reference to Jesus, who always existed as God, and as God, he was spirit, but he didn't have a physical body. He didn't have a human na nature, a human lineage, ancestry. Before he became flesh from the virgin, could he qualify in being that type of son? A Davidic royal son. Could he qualify? No. Exactly. Wow. So when did he qualify? When he was born from the Virgin Mary and became a physical son of David. Go to Luke 1, 
Luke 1 and see. This is what Gabriel tells Mary. Luke 1, we're going to read 30 to 33. It's found in 32, but we're going to read Luke 1, 30 to 33. All right, Luke chapter 1, starting from verse 30. We read, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. His and father will... David. When did yeah. David become his father? After he's conceived from the Blessed Virgin, who's from the house of David. Yeah. So and whose he throne was... is he inheriting? His whose what? throne is he inheriting? The throne David. of David. David, now finish it to 33 of Jacob forever and his kingdom there will be uh, uh, and his kingdom there will be no end hmm. okay so now he now qualifies because now he becomes a physical human descendant of David okay but when does he actually begin ruling as king on the throne as David's representative after his resurrection ascension to heaven so go to acts 2 29 to <clears throat> 35, Acts 2, 29 to 35. Acts 2, 29 to 35. All right, verse 29 says, brothers. Yeah, we got Kingpin, Kingpin misrepresenting my words because he's not paying attention. Kingpin, you're going to get blocked for being a satanic tool by perverting my words. I didn't say Jesus became the divine son at his conception. If you're at least listening and not pretending to listen and being used of the devil, I said, Jesus did not become the Davidic royal son of God until he became human. So don't be stupid and impose your blasphemy and heresy upon me. Go to Acts 2, 29 to 35. All right, verse 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would sit one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw... Uh, and now, before you go on, Peter is Lord. quoting Psalm 16, 8 to 11 as a prophecy David made by the Spirit that his physical descendant, Messiah, would be raised from death to sit on David's throne. So David, being a prophet, foresaw that from his physical loins would come the Christ, whom God would raise to sit on David's throne. But when did God fulfill that? David's own. Keep going. Right. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing for david did not ascend into the heavens but he himself says the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand until i make your enemies your footstool so now notice when god fulfilled the promise to david that your physical son will sit on your throne forever and that is the messiah after god raised jesus from the dead 40 days later, he physically ascended and sat on heaven's throne, fulfilling the promise to David. That's oh. why Psalm 2-7 is quoted. Psalm 2-7 is quoted in reference to Jesus' physical resurrection and ascension to heaven. So let's look at those verses so I can wrap it up with this question. Go to Acts 13, 32 to 33. So then you see it's going to make sense. Acts 13, 32 to 33. Okay, Acts 13. 32, 33. Verse. Paul is preaching to the Jews and he cites Psalm 2-7. All right, verse 33. 32, 33. Okay, verse 32 says, And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. 
So notice how did God fulfill the promise to the fathers to David by raising Jesus from the dead to do what? To take him into heaven physically to do what? To sure. sit on the throne to do what? To fulfill Psalm 2 7. Because don't forget what Psalm 2 7 was. Psalm 2 6 to 7, that was the coronation psalm. When David or his sons sat on God's throne on earth in Zion, which is a hill in Jerusalem, that's the day God adopts them as his sons. And he acts as their father to protect them against their enemies if they maintain faithfulness. When? When they sit on the throne. So when did Jesus sit on the throne as a son of David? When he went to heaven. Whoa. So are you seeing the connection? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and this is, this is now confirmed in Hebrews 1. Go to Hebrews 1. This is the last one. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. So catch it there. Notice when Jesus fulfills Psalm 2-7. Wow. Okay. And I got to add another point to this. And notice when Jesus fulfills Psalm 2-7, where the Davidic king sits on the throne, beginning his reign as a son of David. And on the day he begins his reign, he becomes the royal son of God, the Davidic royal son of God. Notice when. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Verses 3 to 5. Hebrews 1, verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So notice when. When he becomes superior to angels and inherits a better name, when he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's right. You catch or it? Before you finish, though, because you got to sink in. After he made purification, purged our sins, he sat at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become superior to angels as the name inherited is superior to, to theirs. What? Name did he inherit after he sat at the right hand of the majesty on high? Here it goes. Now read Hebrews 1 5. Yeah. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now notice in the context of these verses, these were about the king reigning on God's throne in Zion, and this was about Solomon. The second quotation, I will be a father to him, he'll be my son. That's what God said to David about Solomon. Why are they applied to Christ? Because like Solomon, Jesus is the heir of David's throne. Like Solomon, he sat on the throne of David on behalf of David. And like Solomon, on the day that he sat on the throne, he became that kind of son of God. Right? Now, but didn't it say in Psalm 2, 6 to 7, it says, I've installed my king in Zion. Isn't Zion a hill on earth? Right? Yeah. With me, you guys, right? Yeah. So, but Jesus never was installed as king on Zion on earth, right? Yeah. Right? right? Okay. Oh, but hold on. Go to Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Oh, dude, you said you're done. No, I'm just kidding. No, because there's two, there's two Zions and two Jerusalems. Hebrews 12? Yeah, Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Right, Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the yeah, city. Of before you move on. They're coming to Mount Zion. But which Mount Zion? Pay attention. To the city of what? To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So Jesus was installed as king in Zion. Heavenly Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Zion, which is a shadow of the reality. Right. Wow. Okay, go ahead. So you've come to Zion in heaven, heavenly Jerusalem. And who's there? Keep going. And to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So Jesus physically, bodily ascended to heaven, to heavenly Mount Zion, to sit on the throne in heavenly Jerusalem as a physical human descendant of David, fulfilling the promise to David. When he sat on the throne, he then became 
the Davidic royal son of God. As God, he's always been the son of God by virtue of his divine nature. He is the eternal divine son. But as the Davidic son, the, the Davidic royal son of God, the one who inherits the throne given to David, that only became a reality for him after he became a physical descendant of David and then entered heaven as a physical descendant of David to sit on the throne as a physical descendant of David. That's why in Revelation 22, 16, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to bear witness to the churches. He goes, I am, I am, not I was, I am right now in glory, the root and offspring of David. I am right now in heaven, the offspring of David, because I'm still a physical human being with a physical ancestry to David, the bright and morning star. There you go. Wow. <laughs> That's great, Amen. man. Awesome. Um, we still have about 15 minutes. Uh, no, go ahead. You, have... you said you had another question. Uh, the, the next one is, dude, I, you kind of gave me 17 more questions over here, but I'll just give you the easy one. This is an easy one, but it came up the other day. Is a, you know, I think I may have asked you last time. I, ho I hope I did it. But the one where it says um, he didn't know only the father knows the day yeah. and the hour. Yeah. Okay. That's Mark 13, 32, and also found in Matthew 24, 36. Of the day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the son, but the father alone. Well, there are two ways of interpreting this passage. There is what is considered the traditional view, and then there is... A view that's faithful to scripture and i believe first championed by augustine the word the day or hour no one knows idol in greek doesn't mean ig being ignorant of something but choosing not to make known something that you already know what do i mean <clears throat> go to first corinthians 2 verse 2 where the same greek word is used by paul so i'm going to repeat my answer there's two ways of interpreting this passage this view that i'm giving you is actually Anthony Rogers preferred interpretation. This is his favorite interpretation. And it's an ancient one. He didn't make it up. You can find it even articulated in Augustine. Augustine, some pronounce it. Uh, the word for no, Ido, if I, my memory serves me well, it's a form, it's a form of Ido. Anyway, notice how Paul uses this word no in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. Okay, give me a second, brother. Yeah, check it out. And then there's the second view, which is the okay. majority view, which is can read it if you want. Go ahead. Okay. For I have resolved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now notice that's the word, same word, no. Does that mean Paul knew nothing at all except Christ's crucifixion? Is that what it means? No. So Paul didn't know that his name is Paul? He didn't know where he was, who he's writing to? He didn't know his birth. He didn't know his family. He didn't know the other apostles. He only knew Jesus crucified. Mm. So what does no here mean? Here, no means I chose not to make known, not to reveal or speak about anything except Christ's crucifixion. Similarly, if we go with that definition, what Jesus is saying is of the dare hour, no man can make known. Neither the angels of heaven can make it known, nor the Son, but the Father alone chooses to make it known. And when he does so, he makes it known through the Son. So this Greek word means like to make it known? It means either choosing not to make it known or <clears throat> you can choose to make it known. Because again, what does it mean in verse 2? You're just reading it. Explain to me what Paul meant. I chose not to know anything. I, I always kind of understood it like he says. It's like I'm, I'm just going to ignore everything else and just focus on this because there's Yeah, so but if you're going to ignore something else, that means you must know the thing you're ignoring. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. You can't ignore something you don't know. Okay. So why is he choosing to ignore? Because to him, all these other things are irrelevant. Yeah. I prefer to make known to you the crucifixion and nothing else. Right. Okay, so if we take that definition, that definition. That means when I now apply that definition to Mark 13, 32 or Matthew 24, 36, this is what the meaning is. Uh -huh. Of the dare hour, no man can make known. Neither the angels of heaven can make known, nor the Son, but the Father, because it's the prerogative of the Father to choose when, if at all, the knowledge of the dare hour will be made known. So in this interpretation, it's not so much that they're ignorant 
as it is that it's the father's choice whether the knowledge of the dare hour is something that can be revealed or not because even the son cannot speak apart from the father he can only speak what the father wants people to know no more no less that's not because the son doesn't know what the father knows it's because the son is perfectly obedient to the father and will only make known what the father wants people to know right oh, okay right now i'll give you i can show you from john where jesus says i only speak what the father tells me to speak right here let's i mean let's look at it go to john 5 30. so this interpretation is actually preferred by anthony rogers and it's an ancient view by augustine but there's a traditional view that explains it in terms of the two natures of christ i can explain that if you want but this one is very simple and it's accurate and faithful to the text so you're not butchering the word you're not eisegeting you're not forcing meanings of, of of terms into the verse because that's what the word can mean but anyway go to john 5 30 what does jesus say because the word there's also the word gnosis right that means no yes. but that's yeah but that's not the word used here okay so steve you want to go to john 5 40 5 30 okay, 5 30 I mean. yeah okay all right while you're doing this uh, i just want to uh jennifer uh yamamoto thank you so much for the super chat and uh, I want to make a quick comment uh, to our friend Frank Smithwell. You said that you were timed out last time, but I just noticed you are actually on Facebook. We cannot time you out from here, by the way, if you're on Facebook. So it seemed like it's a Facebook issue. Go ahead, brother. Okay. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. So did you catch it? I only speak what I hear from the Father. So what my Father wants me to tell you, I tell you, no more, no less. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm go to Johnny. Go to John eight twenty eight. Yeah. John eight twenty eight. Eight twenty eight. But and I was thinking this when the disciples asked him what if he's going to set up the kingdom, and, it's and not he for said, you to know. Yeah, or the Father. It's what the Father has kept in his exactly. Mind. That's Acts one six to seven. Are you now going to restore the king of Israel? And then he says, it's not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has ordained by his authority. Okay, so Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. So I only speak what the Father has taught me, right? Yeah. Now a few more, John 12, 49 to 50. John 12, John 20. John 12, verses 49 to 50. And then read it when you get there. Okay. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Wow. Yeah. See that? Did you finish it in verse 50? Oh, isn't that that has to be yeah. Yeah. yeah, read one more time. So it's sinking because the wow. Yeah, just read one more time. Verse 50. For I did not speak. Oh, just 50? Okay. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So okay. whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. So Jesus is telling you, I only speak and reveal what my father wants me to make known no more or less so in light of these statements the greek word can legitimately be interpreted to mean of the dare hour no man can make known now we know why they can't because they don't know it unless god reveals it to them neither the angels in heaven can make it known now we know why that's the case because they don't know it unless god reveals it to them but when it comes to the son nor the son makes it known except the father not because the son doesn't know because the father can only do what the father tells him to do so though they may have the same omniscience, that omniscience that they possess, only that which the Father wants to make known will the Son reveal. Wow. Wow. So that interpretation contextually makes sense and it's faithful to the text so that you don't have to adopt the traditional view which says that Jesus as a man in his waking consciousness in his human mind can only know what the Father wants him to know because in his human mind it's impossible for him to be omniscient. Because if he was, then he's not truly human. But because he has a divine nature and he possesses a divine mind, in that divine mind, he'd be omniscient. But that omniscience wouldn't be fully transferred 
over to his human mind, though he's one person. That's the traditional view. You see the point? Yeah, thank you very much, man. That was great. Yep, well, your questions are good because it helps me revisit issues that we answered and we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear things over again until it becomes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. You answered a lot of questions. You know, I, I mean, I've heard the, uh, some of this before and everything, but man, it just, that thing to go about Jesus being seated and everything, that, you know, that is just, uh, that opens a whole different realm for me. It's like things I've never, I mean, I've been a believer 50 years, but I've never thought about that, you know, like mm -hmm. he took the throne at that moment, you know, and uh, it just it sheds complete different light also on the, on the, when he just asked the Pharisees, you know, whose son is Jesus, whose son is the Messiah, you know, then why does David call him Lord and stuff, you know? Exactly. So, and that Jesus is not saying, see, some people say when well, Jesus is denying that Messiah is the son of David, Mark 12, 35, 37, they go, see, he's trying to tell them your view that the Messiah, son of David was wrong, because if he's a son of David, then he couldn't be David's Lord. So Jesus is showing them that the Messiah is not the son of David. That's how some people interpret it. Mark 12, 35, 37. Now, let me show you why that's wrong. Let's go to Mark 12, 35, 37, because that's important to show. That's not what Jesus was saying. He's not saying, hey, Messiah is not the son of David. Because if Mark, he's a son of David, he can't be his Lord. Mark 12, 35, 37. All right? Watch here. Let me I'm refute that. Sam, um, I'm just letting you know. Uh, there is five more minutes, but brother, we yeah, want well, you to stay as long as we can. I still got time because uh, my brother will let me know when to go to take him to the airport. But right now, we're all right. He's, he's, all right. He's That's great. Okay, Mark 12, 35, 37. Okay, while Jesus was teaching in the temple, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself speaking by the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How can he then be his son? A large crowd listened to him with delight. Okay, now, either Jesus is saying the Messiah is not David's son, that's why he can be David's Lord. Because if he was David's son, he couldn't be his Lord. That's one interpretation. Or it can mean, though the Messiah is the son of David, he's not merely a human being. He's much more than a human being. He's also God. So in a sense in which he can be David's Lord. So either Jesus saying Messiah is the two-natured person. He's God and man. As man, he's David's son. But because he's God, he's more than that. Or he may be saying, no, Messiah is not the son of David. He's just David's Lord because Messiah is from another lineage. Which interpretation makes sense? Which interpretation does Jesus want us to accept? Is he saying, yes, Messiah, though son of David, has to be more than a man because he's also David's Lord. The Holy Spirit revealed to David, the Messiah is your Lord. And the only way Messiah could be David's Lord is if he's more than a human son, because no human son can be his father's Lord. How much more? Well, he's also David's God because he's a son of God. Is that what Jesus is saying? Or is it like some people who claim, no, Jesus is trying to change the outlook, the understanding of the Jews. So you got it wrong. Messiah's not David's son. He's his Lord. Therefore, he's not from his household. Well, the way you answer that, you go to Mark 10, 46 to 48. Mark 10, 46 to 48. And see the answer. So if you understand Jesus' point, it's one of the most powerful testimonies from Jesus himself that he's the two-natured person. He's one eternal divine person who's God and man. From Jesus' own mouth, blessed mouth, if you understand the argument. But in Mark 10, 46, 48, notice what the Lord is said to be. They came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with the large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth, uh, it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Mm. And so he he's the son of David, huh? So he is the son of David. Right. But then notice, keep reading all the way to 48. Many rebuked him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And then the Lord goes on to heal him. But notice, he calls him son of David, and Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm not David's son. No, you are the son of David, but you're also the Messiah and David's Lord. Well, hold on, Jesus. You said, because you're David's Lord, how can you be a son? 
Because if you're merely human, no son can be the Lord of his father. Well, because I'm more than human. I'm God in the flesh. So as God, I'm David's Lord. But as a man, I'm his son. So Jesus just affirmed his two natures, that he's one person with two natures. He's the God man. Wow. From Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. So Red that, all right. Yeah, next question, Steve. That's all I got. So. All right. All if right, you want to take a question or two Fred. from the from the audience, I can take at least two more questions, Godling, if they have any. If not. Yes. Uh, do we have any questions from our wonderful audience? Um, let me see. Uh, we have, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know if you can interpret that or not, but uh, that's basically uh, one comment. That's He's in, like he's getting shocked, like, wow, all right, glory to these guys. He had a good crowd. He had about like 270, glory to God, for this yeah, time. Kyle, Most Kyle, people in New York are asleep. Yeah, Kyle Marks, you know, you're talking about the Council of Nicaea. You might have just caught us uh, at the end. We talked about this at the beginning of the show, so you might want to go to the yeah. beginning of the show. So I think he's I asking me something. Uh, I, let, let me ask you because that's important. Uh, he's asking me, do I accept the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon? Now, let me explain to you the importance of that. All Christians accept Nicaea. Protestants who are informed accept the Council of Nicaea and the Nicene Creed. Um, all Christians accept the Council of Constantinople, 381, where they talked about the Holy Spirit, even informed Protestants. Where the division occurs is at the Council of Ephesus in 431 and the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Let me explain why. In the 5th century, 400s, because this is a very important question. Maybe we'll end it with this. There was a Christian named Nestorius, a bishop, and I forget the region. But anyway, it doesn't matter. He refused to call Mary Theotokos, 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 meaning the God bearer, the mother of God. He said, call her Christotokos the Christ bearer, the mother of Christ, because he didn't want pagans to misunderstand the terminology. Because if you say Mary's the mother of God, like Muslims today, oh, well, what are you saying? That Mary is older than God? Mary generated Father, Son, and Spirit? No, that's not what we mean. We mean that that human child in her womb was still truly God in her womb. He never stopped being God. So she's the mother of God in the sense that God the Son entered her womb to become human from her blessed flesh anyway he got into hot water with cyril i believe it was cyril of alexandria i believe i'm going by memory guys forgive me someone will correct me in the comment section and he was accused of splitting christ into two persons in other words if you believe christ is one person then he's god who was in her womb who became flesh to say that she's only the mother of christ you're splitting the divine christ from the human jesus and that's heresy so he's condemned as a heretic now the Church of the East, my, my ancestral church, agreed with Nestorius that it's more appropriate to call her the mother of Christ. So they didn't agree with the Council of Ephesus, so they were condemned as heretics. Then the Council of Chalcedon came, and the Council of Chalcedon, where you get the Chalcedonian Creed, stated, if you deny that Christ has two natures and two wills, so as a man... He has a human nature and a human will with a human mind and human spirit. And as God, he has a divine nature with a divine mind and a divine will, right? Then you're a heretic. Now, what, the problem with that is then you have the Coptics who come and say, well, we don't like to speak of Christ having two natures or two wills because the human nature has been devonized, theosis. So though he's still a man with a glorified physical body, we prefer to talk about one nature of Christ. So they were condemned. So if I agree with these councils, I'm saying Coptics are heretics and the church of my ancestors are heretics, and I'm not willing to go that far. I don't think they're heretics because if you really ask, and don't take my word for it, no Coptic scholar denies that Jesus is a man with a glorified physical body in heaven. None. No informed, educated member of the Church of the East thinks there is a divine person and a human person that united they believe Christ is one eternal person that became flesh. And then though Mary is the mother of Christ, he was still truly God in her womb. They still affirm that. It's arguing over what I call semantics. Well, what does knuma mean? And this is a debate above my pay grade, and I can't settle this debate, but I'm not willing to say if someone rejects Chalcedon or Ephesus, they're heretics. Because if you really ask them, Church of these, Mary 
was carrying God in her womb. That was God taking flesh from her. Though we call her the mother of Christ, not the mother of God. And Christ is one divine person who took on human nature, not a divine person and a human person. Coptics, ask them. They're here. Don't take my word for it. Coptics, do you deny that Jesus is a glorified man in heaven with a glorified physical body? They'll say, no, we affirm that. But we only like to speak of one nature, one fusus. That's the debate. There you go. Yep. Um, I really can't see any questions here. Um, is there anything else, uh, Sam, you want to share? Well, no, that was, that was it. I just want to be careful because um, look, if you affirm Council of Chalcedon Cal Ephesus, amen. But remember, this is now at the stage in which the church is divided. Let me just share this final point. When the churches are unified as a unified whole, when they come together as a unified body in agreement, know that's of the Holy Spirit infallibly. Because the Holy Spirit will never allow a unified church where all the branches of Christianity come together to agree on error. The Holy Spirit is sovereign and will not allow that to happen. But what you have now is a divided church. In the 5th century, at the Council of Ephesus, a branch of Christianity was cut off. At the Council of Chalcedon, another branch was cut off. So now, in these councils, it's no longer a unified body coming together to agree. It's now a disunited body, so we need to be careful. When the body in union agrees, know that's the work of the Holy Spirit. But when it's fragmented, you can say, well, it is the Holy Spirit, or you can say it's not, because now the, the church is disunited. It's just like the Orthodox will tell you, after the schism of 1054, any councils convened by Rome, by the Roman Catholic Church, is not an ecumenical council that binds all Christians because the church is no longer in union, it's disunited. There you go. Yeah. Um, Sam, there is a question. I mean, it, it's an excellent one. I mean, if, if you think like it's going to take a while, we can start with it next time. Uh, as you know, I mean, the question basically, the questioner is, is referring to the fact that if you go to 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37, You'll see that the accounts are exactly yeah, identical. You find the same thing in Second Second Chronicles thirty six, of course, towards twenty one and down. And Ezra. Yeah, that's a stupid uh, argument. Why is it a stupid argument? Uh, he, he's just wondering how can yeah. he? I mean, if this uh, uh, maybe somebody's raising it and saying there is a plagiarism. No, Ahmad Didat raised it. Ahmad Didat raised it. Yeah, that's an Ahmad Didat argument. Okay, so Second Kings nineteen, word for word, exactly identical to Isaiah thirty seven. That's the argument. That's is that his argument? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, for the life of me, I can't understand. Why would it be a problem? Why would it be a problem for an inspired author exactly. to quote verbatim the inspired book of an inspired prophet? Why would you have a problem with 2 Kings having a copy of Isaiah and simply quoting Isaiah 37 word for word? When that's an inspired book by an inspired prophet and he's including inspired material into his writing, why would that be a problem? Exactly. I'm only an idiot would say this, but I'm not saying the guy who asked the question is an idiot. Only an idiot like Didat would say that's a problem. Just like we had another idiot saying, if Jesus is God, who's he praying to? If the Quran is uncreated, who is it praying to when it intercedes for Allah if it's a speech of Allah? Anyway, but that's another topic. That's it from my end. So if you have any other questions, I'll no, no problem. Uh, there we have someone by the name Aziz uh, Hasanov. Uh, do you know anything about him? Hasanov? He, well, I mean, impeccability of Christ. How can you deny the impeccability of Christ when Christ is absolutely, immutably perfect, sinless, holy, and flawless? If anyone's impeccable, it's God. And if Jesus is God in the flesh, he must be impeccable or he can't exactly. make any mistakes. So I don't know what you're asking me. Jennifer is saying, does Sam have any articles regarding the New Covenant? Have you dealt with the New Covenant? In what context? The New Covenant is a broad topic. What do you mean? New That's covenant? right. That's right. So, uh, Jennifer, if you can be specific, that'll be good. Um, why does Paul add in Hebrews 8, 9? What is what? I don't understand this. Why does Paul add in Hebrews 8, 9 the phrase he disagreed, uh, disregarded them? I have no idea what he's talking about. You need to prove something was added. Are you telling me that the textual tradition, the Old Testament textual tradition in the first century lacked that phrasing? The proof would be on you to show that. 
because on, if you're not aware of textual criticism, then you won't be aware that you have various text types of the Old Testament. You have the Samaritan Pentateuch, for example. You have the Hebrew textual tradition underlying the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then you have the Hebrew textual tradition from which you get the Greek versions and so on and so forth. And in these textual traditions, you do have variations that do not contradict nor change the meaning or the theology of these books. And these variants are preserved in the manuscript tradition so nothing is lost. So the burden of proof is on you to show that Paul was quoting the text that added, right, as opposed to later texts omitting. But nothing lost because it's preserved. Well, I mean, uh, Jennifer, I, I know it is a quotation from Jeremiah 31, 31, but I'm not seeing the phrase that you're talking about. I just went and checked right now, so I'm, I'm not seeing it. You know, one thing I found that in Hebrews, like, because uh, I, I did a study on the, uh, you know, like where it says, you a body you have prepared for me, whereas in, in Psalms it says you open my ear, you know. Oh, it's the same. They're taking the same concept. You know, yeah, that's, that's the, the tra textual tradition. But we got this Muslim complaining. Abu Bakr, can you be more man than Aisha was? Can you call me on Skype so I can debate you on that question? Because not only will I answer your question, but then I'm going to bury you in your own argument against the Quran. Because you're not going to tap dance. If you're consistent, you're going to have to bury the Quran. Because we have an answer. Jesus is not the Father. Now, either you're a liar or you're stupid because you don't know what the Trinity is. Jesus is not the Father. He's the eternal Son who speaks to the Father because that's what distinct persons do. But you have a problem because the Quran is a speech of Allah. And how can Allah's own speech be speaking to him and arguing with him on the day of resurrection? See, the moron is you. It's your theology that's stupid and irrational. But can you now call me on Skype so we can debate this point to see if you have the courage to try to refute me and defend your nonsense that you call revelation? But no, we know you don't have the confidence because you're less man than Aisha. Poor Aisha, a nine-year-old who was mounted by a 54-year-old in the name of your God. I pray that at least in the case of Aisha, Jesus had mercy on her. She didn't die under God's wrath because it wasn't her fault that someone old enough to be her great-grandfather, a pedophile, mounted her and defiled her and damaged her, doing irreparable damage. May God have mercy on her, not on Muhammad who's burning in hell. But anyway, call me. Let's see if you're brave. Come on, man. Make my day. Unlike you, we have answers because neither your God nor your messenger can answer our objections. Glory to Jesus. And even in your tradition, Jesus is alive and Muhammad is dead. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But good. Brother. Amen. Amen. You're leaving, brother? No, I got about 15 more minutes. So it's up to you. Okay. You so uh, now I know what Jennifer is referring to when it came to Jeremiah 31, 31. She's talking right. about the new covenant that Jeremiah referred to. I'm not really so sure, Jennifer, if you're thinking like there is a new covenant that changed things or you want to just clarify what it means. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Are you asking... Is it a new covenant? Well, yeah, there are aspects of it. It's brand new because right. the new covenant points to the consummation and fulfillment of the old covenant, its promises in Jesus Christ. So obviously, when Jesus comes to fulfill it, things will change. But they're not changing in a manner that contradicts what's there in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is designed to find all of its fulfillment in Jesus, meaning everything in the Old Testament from circumcision to sabbath to the sacrifices to the priesthood were meant to point to jesus fulfilling them perfectly and he did even circumcision points to jesus and he fulfilled it in his death and resurrection but it requires more than a two-minute soundbite and more than one session for, to, sh to show you how all of it for example why get circumcised on the eighth day why the eighth day why not the sixth day why not the seventh day well medically just a medical benefit to show you the beautiful wisdom of god how mind-blowing the commands of God are. Ask any doctor. Vitamin K is a natural blood clotting agent. It starts forming in the body and becomes optimum. Its optimal levels reach its optimal levels on the eighth day. So no better day than the eighth day to circumcise because now vitamin K is fully formed in the body and vitamin K acts as a natural blood clotting agent. So notice the medical benefit in obeying God and circumcising on the eighth day. Don't take my word for it. This is a medical fact. A, a baby starts developing vitamin K, and vitamin K in the body of the baby reaches its optimal level on the eighth day. And vitamin K is what's used to stop excessive bleeding. You see? You see that? Yeah. Uh, maybe we should do uh, an entire session on new companies. Now notice uh, Abu, Abu Bakr, this filthy dog, is blaspheming Jesus. 
because he thinks that Jesus offered himself to Satan, his God, and Muhammad's father. See, that's what you do with these blasphemous wine. They're less men than Aisha. Yeah, so uh, you give us opportunity to disrespect Muhammad, that dog, because of dogs like you who blaspheme Jesus. But you, like I said, you're not man enough to call me on Skype and debate me. Prove me wrong. But go ahead, brother. I was going to say we need to do a, an entire session on the new covenant because sometimes sure. I heard people thinking like it abrogated the old covenant. That's not no. the case. There is no abrogation. No, we don't believe in abrogation. We believe in consummation, which is different. People may exactly. think it's semantics. It's not semantics. There's a difference between abrogation, Allah Muhammad and his God, his fake God, and consummation. There's nothing in the Old Testament that, quote unquote, is abrogated in the sense of Islamic theology. Because it's fulfilled because it's pointing to a greater reality like circumcision circumcision points to spiritual regeneration I'm not making it up. Let me just give you the verses. I'm not gonna have time to read them Write down Deuteronomy 10 16 Jeremiah 30 verse 6 Jeremiah. I'm sorry Deuteronomy 10 16. So I'm trying to speed up Deuteronomy 10 16 Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 Deuteronomy 10 16 chapter 30 verse 6 Jeremiah 4 verse 4, Romans 2, 28 to 29, Colossians 2, 11, all the way to 13, and add also Acts 7, 51. I hope I don't have to repeat that because you can just rewind it. All of these passages point to having your ears and your hearts circumcised. God circumcising the evil foreskin of the hearts of his people and circumcising their ears so that they are now enabled by the Spirit to obey the things of God and act upon them. So he shows that physical circumcision is a picture of spiritual circumcision, where God makes you alive spiritually, empowers you to overcome sin, and walk in the life of the Holy Spirit. So what does physical circumcision point to? Spiritual circumcision. Now, if you read the New Testament, who ushered in that spiritual circumcision? which refers to the new creation where we're made anew, renewed, transformed. Jesus, because Jesus on the day he was raised, was raised as the first fruits of the new creation. The first fruits of human beings will be restored and made immortal, physically immortal, morally incorruptible, which Jesus guarantees by being the first one to be raised to physical immortality. So who ushered in the new creation, the spiritual circumcision? Jesus, as a guarantee that we will follow if we believe in him. What day did he usher in spiritual circumcision? The first day, Sunday, which is the eighth day, the day after the Sabbath. So notice being circumcised on the eighth day points to Jesus ushering in the new creation, the spiritual circumcision, which took place on the first day because it's the first day of the new creation that he ushered in by his resurrection, which took place on the eighth day. And that's Colossians 2, 11, 13. You were circumcised, not by human hands, but by the spirit when you were buried with him in baptism and raised by God through faith. There you go. That's just one of many. Yes. Wonderful. There you go. So there you go. I really don't see, do not see anything else so far that worth answering. And I emphasize worth answering. Okay. Let me refute someone just said, stay away from Islam. No, I did not say Mary is not the mother of God. I cannot believe in my presence, you guys are twisting my words and slandering me like sons of the devil. Only a son of the devil can hear what I say and misrepresent me with evil intent. Either the Lord grant you repentance or give you what you deserve. No, I did not say Mary is not the mother of God. She is the mother of God because Jesus in her womb was still truly God who took on flesh from her flesh. Please don't misrepresent me because I'm going to humiliate you because that's satanic to bear false witness. Stop lying. The Lord shame you for lying. I just wanted to be clear. And thank the sister for sending that to me, Netta, so I can correct that lie and slander. Yeah, she does that also all the time with me. Tells me that you are slandering me, so that's how I know. Well, that's why I'm going to have to school you anyway. All righty. Well, uh, folks, um, unless you have an excellent question to ask related to the topics, 
uh, I see some comments that really make no sense to me whatsoever sometimes, or at least it's not worthy even of discussing. If you have any question uh, that worth spending time and talking about it, please do so. Don't ask me about why Paul this and Paul that, you know, because we've done enough shows on this. By the way, Thomas, what I meant was it prevents excessive bleeding. So sorry, sometimes I may use terminology incorrectly. A blood clot, that's when a blood clots up. You're right. I meant that stops excessive bleeding. So I hope that came out clear. And this is not me, by the way. Just again, Chef Google, the greatest scholar ever lived. Vitamin K, eight day. It reaches its optimal levels on the eighth day. No better day than the eighth day to circumcise. So notice the medical benefits of following God's commands. In fact, real quickly, we're going to end it. You had a good crowd today, brother. You had about 300. May the Lord increase your subscribers and views. And same with Steve. Make sure you subscribe to Steve's channel. We'll make this guy go viral, even though he's not as pretty as me. But just to let you know, even in the Old Testament, you're told not to eat the fat of the animal. Well, we know what fat does, right? It causes heart problems, clogged up arteries. So there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that are actually amazing medical benefits. For example, the scavengers that you're forbidden to eat and the marine life that you're forbidden to eat, like shrimp. These are all animals that feed off of the garbage. For example, you don't eat vultures. You don't eat rats. Because what do they prey on? They prey on the garbage and even shrimp. They eat the, the garbage, the debris in the seas. So when you eat them, you eat the garbage that they ingest. And these were all forbidden in the law. So notice the medical benefits from following the commands of God. But thank the Lord I can eat sausage pizza. Praise his name because I love sausage pizza. Amen. Heaven tea. Okay, so we've done enough shows, me and Sam, on the fact that Paul was mentioned in early Islamic documents sources so please go ahead and google that you are going to find these shows that will give you ample material to use so hopefully right. that answers your question thank you hopefully by the grace of jesus we made no mistakes if we did lord forgive us correct those errors so we don't repeat them and bless steve bless al bless their families bless everyone who's listening bless my daughters and preserve us for your glory to be in love with you even unto death or until you return lord jesus and use our ministries that you don't need to glorify you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, Maranatha, amen. Now, my Slav brother needs attention. You see what well, I'm doing? blessing for the cat. Our cat. You need attention? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm glad he's flying out. But anyway, guys, I hope to bless you. Steve, you're no too problem. silent. Here he huh? goes. He needs attention. He's going to come on camera. Here he goes. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, brother. Next time, we'll talk about the new covenant. And right, uh, I appreciate everyone being here. Oh, and uh, that's uh, Sam's brother. Pray for Sam. Not by so choice. He he's, he's proof of predestination. <laughs> he's proof of predestination. If I had a choice, my brother would be others than one. But God predestined it. See, for their, their blessing. I'm leaving to Chicago. So leaving on a gentleman. Lord be with you and preserve you and all of us. All right, guys. All right, man. God bless you guys. Take care. This is Al Fadi over.